Welcome back, y'all. On the last episode, I barely scratched the surface of my life. This time, I'm diving a little deeper. See, the thing is, I used to believe my past would stop me from connecting with others. I used to close myself off to everyone. What I've learned is that I speak through my art. By the end of this film, you'll learn about some of the experiences some of us had to deal with growing up in the town. far I go in life, never forget where you came from. A kid from Oakland. Growing up in Oakland. 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 All my life, born and raised right here. In Oakland, California. Born and raised. That, oh shit, I came from a war zone, but went to another war zone in Oakland. I'm from Oakland. East Oakland, bitch. <laughs> I got the North, got the East, got the West with me. So I suggest you niggas don't mess with me, nigga be cool. Coming from Oakland, you know, who would have thought? Like, all the odds are against us. Oakland ain't the spot that you would expect people to come out of, but, you know, it's always, it always had that culture that you can't give up just because, you know, where you at. It just makes you want to grind harder to prove to people that Oakland is, is, is a place that people come out of, you know what I mean? So I grew up on 38th and Allendale. And everyone in this video pretty much grew up in different parts of the town. And even though we came from different places, we all seem to have similar struggles. See, Oakland's broken down into a couple different parts. East Oakland, Deep East Oakland, West Oakland, and North Oakland. Oh, I guess you can't forget about the rich folk in the Oakland Hills too. South Oakland just was non-existent for some reason. Born in Yemen, came here when I was four years old, so I... Uh... I'm from Oakland. Yeah, Oakland, part, West part. Oakland, <laughs> the bottoms, the bottoms, the bottoms, right? <laughs> See, I'm from 38th, East Oakland, California, 38th Avenue to be exact. Um, in the hundreds, the 80s, on from the 90s, so just all over East Oakland, I just was raised. First neighborhood in Oakland was North Oakland, and then my dad ended up getting a townhouse in. 102nd. Started in West Oakland, as you know, the great migration of my mother's family is from Shreveport, Louisiana, migrated to West Oakland where only African Americans were allowed at a time. Oakland is the place that gave my mom a place to live and hope. Because Oakland is where my parents came from, the, the Khmer Rouge. Originally from 71st, that's where I grew up as a kid with my mom and my cousins, you feel me? But from there, you know what I mean? Going through shit, you know what I'm saying? If you're young and you black, then you know, you know what I mean? You go through shit with your parents and all that type of shit, so you feel me? And then, you know, I'm here on 35th now, and that's why I was born and raised when I say I'm 35th. Early life, I'm gonna say I was pretty lucky. Uh, I start off pretty good with Oakland. They put me in a street with like kids of my age kids that are also going through some shit. Raised in the same house you were raised on. <laughs> by the same person too. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I do know what you went through yeah. in a way. We went through it di different generations though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went through with the first generation. You went through with the second generation. Mm -hmm. So you actually had a little bit more benefit. But you know, you took advantage of it. You still had the same obstacles. 35th Avenue, Viola Street, everything. Man, that's where I learned everything. <laughs> um, started off kicking it with Aurora, Landy here, um, everybody on the block, VGB, Viola Girl Boy. You know, we knew how to, we learned how to comfort early. Like we under, we knew how to understand like what they're going through and definitely never judge. So it was like very comfortable coming back to the, the block. I didn't, I wasn't excited to go home. I was excited to be on Viola. That was the home. And it was wild. It was always something going on over here every day. It could be raining, sunshine. We was, we was, I'm not saying we was up to no good, but back in the day, we kids all day running around here and it was always like lit. Like it was a turn up for the kids every day. Allendale, Calvin Simmons. Was it Calvin Simmons too? Mm -hmm. Before you went to high school? 
But one thing about you, you went through Freeman High School. I just went there, walked right on through, and, and never went back. Some of us are born into unfortunate circumstances that we don't have any control over. I'm going to try to keep this as real as possible. When I was super young, my parents decided to go their separate ways. And that wasn't an uncommon thing in the town. Luckily, I had my grandparents. They weren't really home much, so I had learned a lot of what I know now on my own. It wasn't easy, as you can imagine, having to do your own laundry at the age of six, sleeping on the couch for a couple years because there just wasn't any room. Man, my grandma, I shared a room with my grandma. My cousin shared a room with her four kids. My cousin was in the living room and then I had my other cousin in the back. So, you know, everybody would come spend a night. She, you know, she opens her own for everybody. My mom, feel me, rough on hard times type shit, you know what I mean? With my auntie, she already taking care of two little boys, you know what I mean, so. Over 30 years already, and they still living at the same place. You know, they don't have enough, but it's getting by. It's, whatever it is, is better than what they were getting in Cambodia. My parents, they still tapped in to this day. Uh, they, they, they broke up when I was like seven years old though. It was hard and honestly wasn't living with somebody that actually took care of me, you know. I'm not trying to badmouth my mother, but she wasn't there for me growing up and my grandma took care of me, so she pretty much came and just took me. And I didn't even really know her like that. She's just like, you gotta come with me. She was a young mom, she, she had me at 21. So, you know, I kind of understand that because I actually have my daughter at 21, have two kids. And I know as a mother, you want to be able to hold on to your children, you know what I mean? But like I say, you know, things were what they was at the time. So, you feel me? My auntie made that call, called my pops, pops came. And I mean, you know, I'm blessed for that. Like, I thank God my pops came, you feel me? Because some pops probably don't come. You feel me? And I respect that. That's why when I got homies that be going through situations, whatever, you feel me? I don't say shit, but I understand, you feel me? And then I just do, if I can, as a homie, to do, you know, do my part, you know what I mean? If I can, you know what I mean, and get some out of my pops, like, to be able to throw it this way, you know what I mean? Then I do that. So he'll just pull up, you know, drop the red off, check on me, and then, you know, I pull up, you know, regular stuff, regular routine, but he wasn't staying there. I think Papa taught a lot of people how to be cool, you know? how the boys to calm the fuck down, because all oh, you motherfuckers, you guys are hotheads. Yeah, I know. I think that's cool too, that uh, we learn different morals and respect from each culture. Like, I definitely knew not to talk to your grandma wild. You know, nothing but respect for her and everyone else's family. When my parents decided to dip, I never took it personal for some reason. I always just saw it as, it's time to grow up. You know, they'd slide through every once in a while to drop off some bread or take me to re-up on some clothes, but other than that, I was just raised by my grandparents. A big influence in my life were my uncles. They were like my older brothers, to be honest. Although they were in and out of prison, they had their own ways of teaching me life lessons. My Uncle Fat taught me about work ethic. Whenever I was around him, I almost always was doing something productive. Learn how to be a hard worker. Learn how to contribute. And see right from wrong. But you know, gra seeing grandma and grandpa work hard every day, you know, nonstop. I don't even think I ever seen grandma had a day off even when she was sick. I don't even think she ever took a day off. And I, I saw that, I respected that about her, you know what I mean? He taught me how to wash cars and that was really my first hustle. But growing up in Oakland, especially during the 90s, crime was at all time high. An outbreak of gun violence in Oakland how guns are being treated like the new urban accessory in a live report. In less than 12 hours, six separate shootings on the streets of Oakland have left three people dead, seven others injured. I've been exposed to the streets in elementary. I just seen people die, you know. I just had someone been shot in front of me. Um, these streets can be really dangerous. These streets don't love nobody. Just seeing people getting jumped, Shootouts, people getting beaten to death, just seeing um, a body, a lady body getting chopped up and put in a trash can. I ain't gonna lie, like, them niggas already on their own shit, and you don't wanna get caught up in your own, on, on your own, it's funny, but you be like your own nigga shit, like, no, my niggas. But then they on a whole different hype when they doing what they doing. We down here on the bottom on some other shit, like trying to get money, you know what I'm talking about? They up there gang banging, so 
it's a lot different in the sense of what they them niggas up there on some like nigga disrespect we gonna step on you we down here getting this money. You disrespect, we gonna step on it. First off, fuck your bitch in the click you claim. West side, when we ride, come equipped with game. You hear about all the violence happening on the news and through your peers, but until you're on the other side, that's when it's really hard to explain. Kafuki, well, I mean, you know, whatever you heard about him is <laughs> it's probably right. You know what I mean? He was a, he, uh, it's a, he was a great guy, though. He had a good heart, really true, loyal to his friends. Had a few anger issues, you know what I mean? But uh, he, he, most of the stuff he did, he always did it for his friends. You know what I mean? He was into a lot of gang stuff, you know what I mean? You probably know. I don't really want to talk about gang stuff, so I'm not going to, you know, go to that. But, yeah, he was really deep into that stuff. Uh, but he always, he would never let his friends down. You know what I mean? If his friends needed help, no matter what time of day it is, they call him, he's there. You know, he's solid, for sure. Well, I was dating someone and um, I moved in with him at a young age. I was 16, his mom took me in. I was having problems at the house. Uh, I got, I gotta be, I was in a domestic violence relationship. So got put in a hospital a couple of times. Um, and then during that whole time, I was hanging out with the wrong crowd too. So I was hanging out with a lot of gangsters. You know, living, being from Oakland, there's a lot of them, especially when you live in the 30s. So I was hanging out with all the wrong people and I just got into a lot of mess. And then I got my cousin in a mess and then she started hanging out with me and we got, it was just crazy. Like we kicked it with the wrong crowd. She done got her tires stabbed. I almost got killed that same day. And we've been through a lot, you know, it's like, it's crazy, it's crazy. I got stabbed, like <laughs> had somebody come through my house. Um, well, went to the back. I lived in a little in-law house in the back, um, came, stabbed me over he said, she said. Before I got uh, nine siblings, you know, I'm the youngest, so everybody was in my ear, you know. I got people that chose different routes in life and everybody always had their prep talks with me. And, you know, at the time I didn't want to hear none of that shit. You know, it's like, I had to go through it. You know, everything was experienced. I had to see some shit. I had to feel the pain. I had to get my hands burnt a few times. All those fights related to those gangs that has nothing to do with me. I don't, I, I, I not ever instigate any of those fights, but I get involved in it because of Uncle Fooky. So Grandma tells me to go help your, uh, go hang out with your brother because he's getting involved in some stupid stuff. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to school here and there. I'm trying to shake my life, but you know what? I'm gonna go see what's going on with this guy. So I go hang out with him and I hang out with his friends and his, man, they're great guys, man. They, they, you see the brotherly love in them. It's like all they do is protect each other. One's messing up, they try to help each other. Okay, okay, we got you, we got you. And, but they always, all they want to do is hang out too, though. So at that age, I'm young, I want to hang out too. And trying to, you know, go hang out with the girls and meet girls and stuff. Hey, that's what I want to do too. So you, I, my intention was to go out there and hang out with Uncle Fuki to, you know, make sure he's safe and okay. And I end up being just like him. You know, partying, hustling, you know, and not focusing on school and doing some bad stuff, but then also hanging out with some great guys too, though, man. And then when they get into some trouble, you, you hang out with them, you're like, they, you got their back, you have to. You ain't gonna run on them. They get into a fight, you're gonna go, oh shit, okay, it's fun hanging out and partying with you guys, but when you get into bad shit, I'm gone. That back in the day, nigga, we was all trying to survive. You feel me, we was all trying to make it home. You feel me, and at the end of the day, nigga, if you harming one of us, nigga, it is what it is, nigga. So, at, so that's how the game go, so but then you get older. Dealing with death at a young age was tough, but not uncommon. To this day, my family still hasn't figured out who shot my uncle, but best believe I'm gonna figure it out. I'll keep digging, and the truth always finds its way to surface, so I'll be patient. Piece of me that I wish that he, they were both around right now. Sometimes I would say if they were around right now, it'd be so much fun. You know, it'd be some bad times too, though. You know, it'd be mom, grandma yelling at him for drinking too much, and Uncle Fuki would probably, you know, calling me at midnight, telling me to go bring him a gun, 
go shoot somebody that's chasing him when he's looking for them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, Jesus, brother. <laughs> I thought this guy's looking for you. I'm over here down the street. I'm sleeping, about to go work tomorrow. You want me to bring you guns and go look for this guy? Like, yeah, forget all that, man. I can take your ass to go eat or something. Crazy ass guy. The com apartment complex I stayed at, that's where all of the little gangbang, gangbang would come here during Cambodian New Year's where this is the place where we're gonna have fun. We're gonna represent what we, you know, our, we're gonna represent our gangs and um, we're gonna show how we get down. So all these little gangs, they're not really beefing at that time, but they're kind of just showing off like, yeah, I'm, I'm that dude. Um, this is my reputation. This is what I could do, um, I'm, you know, and all that. Um, you know, in the shootouts, you know, just seeing, you know, people shooting at here, shooting there, like, damn, this is normal. If the person was like, like hyphy, then you would just be like, oh, and he hyphy, oh, he awesome. But it wasn't like a movement. It was just like, it was like a lifestyle for us at the time. Like, you know what I'm saying? I didn't really look at it as a movement, you know, it was just, just how we rock that, how everybody as a whole, it don't matter what nationality you was, what background you came from, if you was from the town, the damn near the bay, shit, like, you just fucked with it like that, like. Shit, if you was a young nigga kicking up dust, nigga, and you was in that shit, nigga, just because you get old don't mean nothing. Pfft, that's out, nigga, we still remember, nigga. You, can, you didn't probably make niggas mamas cry. You didn't probably, you feel me, on some nigga, yo, some other niggas homie shit, I don't know. You feel me? But hey, I don't worry about none of that, nigga. You know what it is, I know what it is. Nigga, I'm, that's why I just try to keep cool at, in general. Cause I feel like if you still kicking up dust and what the shit is, then you know, that shit gonna come. You feel me? Oh. What was going down in my middle school days was kind of getting respect. It was more than just school, you feel me? It was learning how to get respect. Uh, that you ain't no bitch. You gotta be worried about like people punking on you because that shit was real. But, but then I realized growing up young nigga, everybody middle school niggas get to jumping around because elementary was uh, everybody nearby. Nigga, go to Calvin. Now I got niggas from all the way in the deep East Oakland, seminary, niggas I didn't see when I was growing up on 7-1. You feel me? Like, nigga, the fuck you doing here? Like, what, nigga? Like, how you get to go to school over here? Like, niggas catching bus. Nigga, this is when, I ain't gonna lie, niggas is getting, like, damn near grown. It sound bad, but, like, niggas is becoming grown in middle school. Like, niggas bouncing on the bus, catching their own, making sure they get to school by themselves. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, man, it's, let's go all the way back to like 03, maybe 04, Calvin Simmons. You know, we used to hoop together, you know, you know, we used to ride buses together, go to the movies, you know, kick it, you know, kick it at the house. You know, really, just, just, just kicking it, really, you know, uh, being partners, though, at the same time. Uh, making sure we all was good, we had each other back at the end of the day. Uh, make sure nobody didn't mess with nobody, you know, uh, shit, just being homies. Like, people try to punk on my siblings. I, I didn't want to let it happen. So if anyone fucks with her, like, it's instantly anger. It's controlled by anger. Like, who? Like, I have to be intimidating. Like, communication's out the door at that point. It's about, you know, who the fuck fuck with you and let's teach him how not to fuck with you no more because we can't have that. I don't have time for that. There's other things going on. <laughs> and it was fucked up things that I didn't have to deal with, but it grew, you know, you grew from it. People grow from it. And I remember, you know, your, your uncle Gary, the oldest one, getting beat up by them, picked on by them. And then grandpa would give us like butcher knives and tell us to go to school and then uh, chase them for beating up your, uh, your brother Gary. And I was like, oh shit. And, and then the school would call, well, you know, we would chase them with butcher knives and and the school would uh, send us home, and then the the, the administrators, administration would come to the house and try to talk to uh, Grandpa. and say, yeah, you can't tell your kids to, you can't give your kids knives and, 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 uh, and uh, chase other students. And then my, your Grandpa would tell them, well, how else do you want my kids to protect themselves? You know, you know the kids are like twice the size as them, they're small, and they're being bullied. What do you want me to do? 
And then grandpa would grab and go, tell them, wait a minute, go in the kitchen, grab a knife and chase them off. And next thing you know, he's in Santa Rita for like a week. Oh, grandpa yeah. Went to jail? Oh, yeah, a couple of times. Oh, shit. Yeah, for chasing people down the street with knives. Because they'll come, they'll come home and, and threaten to take the kids, you know, take us away and all kind of stuff. And he was just trying to protect us. He was just, he was just doing what he would do in Vietnam when the Viet Congs would come to our house talking mess. So he would chase them with knives, you know what I mean? That's how it is in Vietnam back then, I was told. But, you know, Grandpa would, would try to protect us. You know, he wouldn't let people beat us up. And he would tell us all together as brothers and sisters, like, you know, protect your brothers and sisters, you know what I mean? Whatever you can. And he didn't know that was against the law back then, you know what I mean? But once he knew, he didn't do it anymore. And, you know, he tried his best, man. He worked all day, all night. Mom would, grandma would work all day. Middle school was when I really started to get down. I got into a lot of fights and I had a really bad temper. A lot of it rooted from the house, though. My family was always getting into it and I guess it just filtered down to me. But one thing my uncles taught me was to never let anybody disrespect me. Cause it ain't like no artificial shit. Like you, yeah, like you really boys, bro. Like for real, bro. Like like back then, I wouldn't let nobody f even till today. Like yeah. I, <laughs> nobody ain't gonna fuck with you, bro. I wouldn't let nobody fuck with you. You feel me? Like no, that's not going down. You feel me? So yeah, yeah bro. So yeah. it's gonna always it's be like, like that, bro. Yeah. From somebody else's experience, like you can't be trying to mess with everybody. You can't try to pick on everybody. So in the midst of that, one of my boys was trying to pick on somebody, and they. Called they homies over there, man. And they all hit the back gate, and uh, it got real. People got hit, hit in the face with chains, and motherfuckers got jumped. You know what I'm saying? Like, and at the end of the day, we find out these was grown men. So it was like you really didn't know who he was playing with. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, it was real for like at the next week after that. Like you know what I'm saying? We ain't let that go. <laughs> we did not. Getting past middle school was a challenge in itself, and next stop was high school. And that's when shit really started getting real. We got the more realer side of life. Like, okay, this is your choice now. You're gonna be a hustler or you're gonna keep going to school. Like, fucking done with the fuckery. You know, like, this is real. Like, you're gonna get down with these bitches. You're gonna get down with these drugs. You're gonna go to school. You're gonna go to work. I feel like I didn't fit because I was still figuring out, at the time, my sexuality. I think growing up in Oakland, being mixed was hard. And it got harder being a girl, and it got harder being gay. At my high school years, I went to McClamets High School. Um, I went to the 11th grade. I didn't quite finish because I ended up getting pregnant with my oldest son, which is Janan. Um, then I ended up going and taking adult classes um, while I was pregnant with him. And after I had him, I ended up having my second oldest child, which is Danon. Um, that's when I finally was able to finish school. Um, then I got pregnant again <laughs> with Dion. Um, I didn't c continue to go to college because I ended up having another child, which is Gary Ante. That's just my youngest child. But all I majority did was like work, work, work to provide for my family. Growing up, I didn't really have a, a role model. Um, someone to, who had a, a profession where I could look up to and be like, hey, I want to be that. It was just more of, he's good in basketball. I want to be like him. Closed in in high school. I didn't want to choose up a lifestyle because I, I knew there was a better side of life. But I had to deal with my shit. I had to <laughs> deal with mom, like kind of growing apart from us. I had to deal with my brother going to the military. I was worrying about my little brother. It was, that's like I said, it got real. Real life problems came through. Like you're getting older. What are you going to do? How are you going to play a role in this family? So uh, I got lost in the street. I basically raised my children by myself. They had their father in their life, but it was things that didn't work out with the oldest three dad. He was alcoholic, very abusive. So I was young and I was being abused by their father. So I finally got the nerves to be able to walk away. Then I finally had another child by another guy. His father's deceased. Um, 
he got murdered April 5th in 2000. Um, so basically I raised my children on my own, like I said, with the help of my mother. Um, moved to West Oakland, um, been here for 18 years, um, same neighborhood, West Oakland. Um, I've seen a lot of things growing up um, from being molested at a young age. Um, some people don't know. I don't talk about it a lot, but it doesn't bother me now because I am the woman I am today, you know, with the help of my mom. Um, lost my mom and my dad a year apart. Um, but I look at it like I'm a strong black woman. Getting money in the town was just like that universal language that everybody spoke. I sold everything from clothes, shoes, pills, weed, you name it. I was about my bread. And the thing is, I ain't never had shit growing up, so it was do or die. So I grew up in the hundreds, and that's when I kind of like really started cutting hair and met a lot of neighborhood folks, playing sports, doing just being kids. And that's really how I started with the barber thing. Like they were just like, hey, I heard you messing around with clippers. It was just being a teenager. And was, they'll meet me in my garage, come to my bathroom, like, hey, just do this for me. And it was just a hobby. And, but it was a hobby that I liked to do. I never thought I was gonna make it my career. I thought I'm gonna be doing something else. It was a little struggle. It was a struggle, I'm not gonna lie. Like I said, if it wasn't for my mom, I wouldn't have been able to take care of my children at all because they'd had no dad in their life. He left their dad because Janan, Danan, and Dion have their own father. Gariante has his own father, but they both end up getting murdered. So I had to do what I had to do, provide for my own children go out there and be mama and daddy to them, you know, push them going up to the schools, um, just doing whatever it all means by necessary to take care of my children. I didn't have to do no robbing, no stealing or nothing, no crimes, none of that, but I did make a way for my boys. Just, you know, as you have more responsibilities and you want more things and, you know, your, your taste of, you know, things are getting more expensive, you know, it make you want to turn your hustle up more. You may dibble and dabble into different things, take more risk. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what it all boils down to is the risk taking. You know, if you, you can do it, you know, however you do legitly, you know, that could take time. You can do it like that too. But, you know, we more mostly we like it to be fast around here, you know, so we, we take a lot of risk. Hanging around the wrong crowd, but I met somebody. He got locked up, possession of drugs, possession of guns. My house got raided. I was actually in handcuff when um, I was pregnant. As you could probably tell through this film, a lot of us went through a lot of shit and it's calloused our tolerance towards just like life. I had to pay a huge tribute to my grandma though for holding it down over the years because she could have left too and she stuck it out with me. I actually don't know who I'd be today without her. Because on that day when my parents left, you know, I was just this little kid waiting for my parents to come and pick me up. But when that door opened, it was my grandma. So that's why I'm so thankful that I raised my sons the way I did. I never hid nothing from them. I wasn't trying to be their friend, I was being a mother. So I'd always told them, if you go out there and do dirt or whatever, I'm not gonna come visit you in jail. <laughs> Even though I love my children, I'm not gonna accept no collect calls from you because you went out there and did dirt. So I think that's how I was able to raise my kids at the man that they are today without them even having a father in their life. You know, sometimes it was difficult, and I ain't gonna lie, sometimes we had our rough, rough errors, you know, we had to weather the storms, but she made it, she always found a way to make it happen though, you know what I'm saying? So that's what made me be on my hustle, you know, pops too. Like we, like I said, just everybody is, whether it was working or whatever else you went to, like everybody has a, a nice hustle about them, you know? So that just made me be well-rounded and always stay hungry, you know? Grounded and hungry. Doing what you can to live out here and survive in these streets, because it ain't easy. Um, Oakland hustle you always got to hustle when you're living in Oakland unless you just got the handout but for me you know I didn't have my parents my grandma passed away I had my cousin but she got her own kids so hustling me to me is gotta get your own money and now having kids you really gotta hustle and 
Yeah. It's just hustling don't even mean getting money. It means getting up, going to get a job, making sure you got a job, being stable. That's what hustling mean to me. You just got to deal with that shit. Now you just got to move accordingly. You feel me? You got to move correctly. And then don't let niggas get in your head and make you get off your rock. Like, oh, you ain't with, or you ain't, nigga. And come on, man. What you talking about, boy? Niggas, niggas real life getting sent up the road to the pen now. You ain't no kid. You getting sent to the pen, nigga. Cold bed. Come on, man. These niggas are trying to trick you, trick you off the streets. <laughs> Once I started to change my life around, I noticed that I started meeting people who were nice to me. and That was kind of weird at first, but I started welcoming it afterwards. Um, my family was an entrepreneur, my grandfather and my grandmother. Um, they owned a store, a restaurant. My grandfather was the lone man in the community. Um, and so our, our family restaurant, which there is actually still a sign, it's called the Barn Restaurant next to Esther's Orbit Room, right across from the 7th Street Post Office. In 11th grade, I changed my way, um, and I learned my potential, um, just not being around negative peers and just focusing on school. That's when I started getting um, 4.0s. And I'm like, damn, this is easy. This is easy, like, and then, so when I was getting 4.0s, people in my neighborhood started learn like oh he got 4.0 he's doing this thing in school but still hanging out coming outside hanging out doing whatever but I just handle business first I, I have a, I'm a mother of a 27 year old son who like unlike your, like yourself um, tried to go down that other route um, unfortunately in 2015 or fortunately for me he was in a rollover car accident and he almost lost his life in a coma for two months and now he's fighting mental health issues and one thing he says, and his therapist says, is that his other friends who are from the hood, who families are more fractured than our family, he says it had to happen to him because his other friends' families couldn't have withstood it. Um, and I have to say that in that, he gives me hope. And that for those kids, like when his dad was here, they just wanted a male to talk to. And I, you know, um, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, my son is an avid reader. He sees himself as going into the community and giving them hope. He, I call it reading rainbow. When I met her, I say, my son is actually reading your book at Foothill and 22nd Avenue at the bottom of someone's basic grandparents' house to all of his friends who are living the thug life because he wanted to educate them on, you have to get this knowledge. Don't believe the hype. And so that's hope. And I think in the next generation, I always meet young people such as yourself. I was like, I can retire one day because I do believe that our future are in good hands. And so I really want to instill that there's an opportunity and um, hope for them to do something different. It's never too late. Making something out of it instead of just making it an excuse like, oh, well, um, school was poor or this, that is why I don't want to do nothing. But it really is, you know, making something out of it. Doing what I'm doing is kind of like a inspirational type thing because not everyone is a barber, you know. Because I mean, at, and it's crazy because at the beginning I was like, you know, I like it, but would I, would I still be doing this because I wasn't making much, um, I wasn't at no shop. You know, I'm like, man, I'm just doing this out of my house. And it's like, man, like, should I be, like, but then I just, I, I like what I was doing, but just the situation I was at, I, I was like, should I still be cutting hair? Should I just work somewhere? But my passion kept me going. Like, I know it's kind of cliche when people say that people from the town are bred a little differently but I think it's really true. When you come from the town, you just wired a little differently than everybody, but I like it. The real ones. You know, I feel like people want to leave, but then people always find their way back here. Because you know, in the end of the day, this is home, right? There's nothing like the Bay, and I think it's it's rooted in our activism, right? You know, you have the Black Panthers here, and so that energy, I think there's an energy here that's different, um, because we're in 2019, and there's still social justice is core of who we are. Got a job with a, um, as a consultant for the Social Services, social services Director of uh, California, um, and working with foster care youth. And that changed my whole trajectory. And here I am uh, 30 years later, 
uh, working for human services in the city of Oakland. And so public service is my purpose. I work with kids in the Bay Area. I've been doing it for about six years. Work with troubled youth, uh, you know, try to get their minds straightened out and give them hope to change their ways um, and understand that it's okay uh, when you make mistakes, you can change that and still be successful moving forward. Yeah, it's about that time, man. You know what I mean? I'm enjoying it too, man. I'm doing it while I'm young. It gives me something to fight for, you know what I mean, as a parent. You know what I mean? Staying away from the streets, because I'm still young, don't get me wrong, you feel me? I'm turning 30 this year, but I'm still young, you know what I mean? My back's still working, I mean, these hands still, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about? So we keep them up. So, hey, man, like, but at the same time, like I say, keep me focused. I would say that that's most important, keep me focused. When somebody do make it big, they don't change. They always represent Oakland. And until you really make it big, big, Oakland is going to stand behind you regardless. If you made it to the end of this film, I hope that this changes your perspective of Oakland, that you now see the resilience and that the struggle is actually empowering. From the hood to the universe.